Every Bible is going to be turning to Revelation chapter 4. We are going to be in Revelation 4 and 5 to begin here in just, in just a second. I want to express my thanks and my gratitude to you all over this past weekend. The young people, again, I said it this morning, I'll just reiterate it. They were great. And uh, it's always weird being, I mean, I don't know if people who travel and stuff. I'm, Jacob maybe feels this way. I'm, I'm going to say he feels this way too. It's always weird being away from home. Uh, I miss my wife. And I have two very small boys that I miss very deeply. And uh, so I've done a great job at, at showing hospitality, loving strangers. And for a lot of you, I am a stranger. I may be strange too, but uh, so I've done a really good job at, at showing a lot of love, and I appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's weird. I feel like I've had multiple conversations where it's like this person knows this person that I know that knows this person. This is funny how God's body works in that way. And, and even though we don't really know each other, because we're wanting to do the same thing, which is to glorify our God, because we have the same goal, hopefully we have the same goal, uh, it allows us to have kind of a kinship, fellowship is what the biblical word would be, uh, with one another. And so I'm thankful for the work that you do here. I'm, I'm grateful for Jacob. He mentioned it this morning, and <clears throat> he said we were friends, and I appreciated that, because, you know, you don't ever want to be the guy that you're like, we're friends, but he's like, we're not, but... But I have a lot of respect for Jacob, and uh, I appreciate the work that he does. Uh, I look up to him in a lot of ways, and so I'm lo not looking at him because it's a little awkward. But, uh, but yeah. All right, so the lesson this evening is one that I'm like especially passionate about, and and one that I think about often. In fact, whenever I study with people, particularly people non-Christians. The first, book I go, the first book I go to is the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's intentional. And really, the reason why is because if you've ever studied the book of Ecclesiastes, what, it's a big sermon. It's really just one long sermon. And what the sermon is trying to help you understand is that if there's nothing after this, everything you do means nothing. You know that, right? Like whenever he gets to the very end of the book and he says the conclusion, here is the conclusion, when all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the, you're depending on your translation, to say this is the all of man, or it'll say this is the whole duty of man. And then the very last verse is because, because God will bring every deed into judgment, even the things that are hidden, both good and evil. And that might sound like a scary thing, but I think it's actually a good and hopeful thing. Because if there's nothing after this, then all the time that you have ever spent doing anything that was ever sacrificial, Anything that was ever kind of kind or loving or you fill in the blank, it means nothing. Y'all are in college. Y'all, right? Yeah, okay, thanks for the head nod. Those classes that are like pass-fail classes, those one-credit classes versus the four-credit classes, which class gets a little more effort? Maybe imagine your teacher tells you, you're gonna, we're going to take, take this test. It won't be graded. How much are you studying for that test? It doesn't matter because you know there's nothing coming after this. And in a lot of ways, we need to view judgment and we need to view the fact that at the end of all things, God is going to judge and there's something afterwards. That's a good thing because it gives value to everything that you do, both good and bad and bad. There is value in it. And so this weekend, we've been talking about having a passion for God. And really, everything that you do is looking towards, hopefully, a particular end. How often do you think about heaven? Like legitimately. Before you knew this is what we were going to talk about today, did you think about heaven today? Sunday, you came to worship, you sang hymns, all this stuff. In the last month, how often have you thought about heaven? We'll be honest with you. In the times of my life where I either have struggled or I wasn't who I was supposed to be or I had a bad attitude or you fill in the blank, it's because I was not thinking of heaven enough. And my hope is, is this evening that as we spend some time thinking about heaven, that it will help us not just create a, a greater passion for heaven, but it would help us even while we're here expecting to get there. But maybe the bigger problem is we don't long for heaven the ways in which we should because our lives are too good here. 
You get what I'm saying? Everything, when everything is good here, you don't really want things to end. Or maybe the problem is, is that we have maybe a, a we don't really think about heaven, so we don't really know what it's going to be like, so we don't have a, a good picture of what heaven is going to be like. But we won't do this. But like, imagine if you closed your eyes and thought about what heaven would be like. What's the picture in your mind? You know, is heaven going to be a place that like whenever you get up there, St. Peter is like at the gates and he has like the scroll. And depending on like how holy you were while you were here, you might get to like VIP heaven. Or there's just kind of like mediocre heaven for some of you. But, you know, you came to church. So, like, is that what it's going to be like? Or maybe for some people, they think about heaven is like there's like seven stages to it. You know, the afterlife. And you get in and you're in stage one. And really, if you want to advance, you can to like the seventh stage. But you don't have to. You've already made it to the afterlife. Or maybe heaven is a place where you have 42 people serving you all the day long. Now, you wouldn't think of heaven like that, but there are people who think of the afterlife in that way. Like, what's your body going to be like in heaven? Are you going to kind of revert to, like, your best bod while you were here on earth, you know? Are you going to all be, like, little babies with the little, you know, wings, you know what I'm talking about? Like, is that what it's going to be? I'm not trying to be silly, but, like, the New Testament doesn't say a ton about what it's going to be like. And so it kind of leaves us a little bit up in the air. Which is weird, because everything that we do in theory is looking forward to that place, looking forward to that time where we get to be with heaven, where we get to be in heaven. But I think what the New Testament does, that doesn't so much tell you what heaven is going to look like. I think it more gives you a picture of what heaven is going to be like and who is going to be in heaven. And so again, this evening, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, considering maybe trying to stir us up to have a passion for heaven. And there's not a lot of chapters that give, like, here is the image of what heaven is like. But in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4 and in chapter 5, John is taken up and he sees this scene in heaven, which, just as an aside, I think would have been especially important to the seven churches of Asia. You think about how the book opens up, they see this image of Jesus, and then in chapters 2 and chapter 3, here are the messages to the churches of Asia. Here are the things that God wants them to do, and I think that almost as an encouragement, to do those things, to accept the rebuke, to, make, to repent, to make the changes that they have to make. I think as an encouragement, what, what John does is John gets taken up to heaven and he sees this picture of here is what happens. Here is what you stand to gain if you decide to truly devote yourself to God. If you decide to really live this life that is passionate for the Lord. And so as we read Revelation 4, we're going to start in verse 2 and we're actually going to read the whole chapter. And then we're going to go into chapter 5. I want you to look for a word that's repeated over and over and over again. Because there's going to be a word that's repeated just every time, almost every time in these two chapters. And I want us to think about like, okay, so what does John see? And what is happening in heaven? Also, just before, because you're going to see this word as well. There's the word like over and over and over again. The, the idea is these things are not to be taken literal, but it's supposed to be a picture. Because again, John is seeing celestial things and trying to explain it in a physical plane. Does that make sense? It would almost be like trying to explain something to someone who's never seen. Or maybe trying to explain color to someone who's never, never seen. You, you get what I'm saying? Like you're, just like you're you're at a loss for words a little bit. But this is what John sees. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne standing in heaven. And one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. 
And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns down before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Chapter 5 and in verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and people and tongue and nation, and have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our gods, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. Do you get the picture there? Revelation 4 and 5, John gets taken up to heaven and he gets to see this scene of what's happening in heaven. Did everybody kind of have their own little mansion up there? Was that the scene? Is everybody kind of hanging out with their best friends? In heaven, here's the scene. And we won't reread all these verses. Did you notice what the verses were trying to draw your attention to? It starts off by saying there was a throne. And one standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne. And then over and over again, there was a rainbow around the throne. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And the text continues, and out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And you have these, these lamps that are burning before the throne. And before the throne was something like a sea of glass. And in the center and around the throne were these four living creatures. And the, the, these beings are praising the, one, praising the one who sits on the throne forever and ever. And then you get into chapter, they, they cast their thrones down, they're worshiping God. And then you get into chapter five, and now they're praising the one who sits, the, the, the lamb who's uh, around the throne, and they're all, the myriads of myriads, they're all praising God. Because I think what the New Testament, or Revelation 4 and 5 is trying to help us understand, is that when you think about heaven, there's this scene. But that God and his son are at the center of heaven. Did you notice that in the text? That everything that's happening is actually happening. Like it, it's not like God just kind of has like the main mansion in heaven and everybody's kind of like drifting off into the city and if you want to come to town. That's not the picture in Revelation 4 and 5. In Revelation 4 and 5, God and his son are at the center of everything that's happening. They're at the center of heaven. And the text will continue. I think another is that everything that comes out comes out from them. All the lightning, all the rainbow, the water, everything is and from the throne. That's what the text will say. And from the throne came. And from the throne came. Everything that's coming out in Revelation 4 and 5 is coming out from the ones seated on the throne. That everything revolves around them. Did you get that picture? That everything that's happening, anything that's being described, is being described around like where the throne actually is. And that all praise is being given to them. That these living creatures who have their own thrones, their own little thrones it seems like, they're taking their thrones and they're casting it down. That the words that are being said, all the words are being directed to the ones that are seated on the throne. That when you think about heaven, that heaven is about the ones, the one seated on the throne. So here's a question for you. Do you want to go to heaven?
I wonder if sometimes our desire for heaven is just it's better than the alternative. The image given of what heaven is like, again, is that heaven is a place, hopefully yes, uh, but the image is that heaven is a place where God is at the center of it. And if that's true, by the way, the, an- the way that you would answer, do I want to go to heaven, is you would look at this and say, okay, here and now, is this my life? So ask yourself, is God and his son at the center of who you are? Is God at the center of your life? Does everything that you have, do you acknowledge where the source actually comes from? James chapter 1, that God is a father of lights and that every good gift comes from above. Like, Do you recognize that in your life? Does everything in your life revolve around God? Or is God just like another key in the keychain? You know what I'm saying? That whenever you speak, are the things that you're saying, like, would they be praiseworthy to God? Or would they be bringing God shame? Oftentimes, we talk about heaven. We talk about wanting to go to heaven. Or we talk about people being close to heaven. Proximity to heaven has nothing to do with your age. You might be older to dying. You're not necessarily older to heaven. You're not closer to heaven. You get what I'm saying? Your desire to go to heaven really is seen here and now. And so with these questions, I mean, with this idea, we actually have to ask ourselves, why does God offer you heaven? Like if this is happening, by the way, what John sees in Revelation 4 and 5 is not something that's going to happen. That was presently happening. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is, is why does God offer you heaven? What does God gain in you being there? Because he's already being praised. And being praised, it seems like, by celestial beings. So what in the world does God gain from me being there? And then I want to ask ourselves, like, what do I gain from going there? Because if that's the scene, do I really want to be there? Like, what would I gain from being in that place? All right, so let's try to answer the first question here. What does God gain? And I think to really, to answer this question, what does God gain? We have to ask ourselves, what has God always wanted? At least from his revealed word that we have. What is it that God has always wanted? Again, let's just look at what God has done. Because I think through somebody's actions, you can see the things that they desire. And so, in the very beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And he makes man. And we know that he rests on the seventh day in Genesis chapter 2. And we know in Genesis chapter 3 that whenever man falls, that God was walking in the garden with them. Because it seems like, at least in the very beginning, what God desired was to tabernacle or to dwell with man. That was his desire. That's what he wanted. And if you've read the Bible story, you know that sin breaks that. And what God wanted was to dwell with man, but instead man chooses the other option. But God doesn't give up. And so the Bible story continues, and a little bit later on you have this nation of Israel, and they were enslaved in Egypt, and God frees them because, because what God wants, at least at the end of the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 40, they build this tent, and this is tabernacle, and it says that the glory of God fills it. Because what God wants, at least in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, what God wanted was to tabernacle with the Israelites. But if you've read the book of Numbers, God wants to dwell with people, and what, do, what, do, what, do, what does mankind do? They lack faith. They don't trust God. In fact, they even want to go back to Egypt. They choose the alternative. But God just takes the next generation, and he puts them into the promised land, and now he gets to tabernacle with them. And even in 1 Kings chapter 8, they build this temple, and the glory of God again fills the temple because what does God want? He wants to dwell with his people. If you read the story of Israel, and where God wants to dwell with Israel, Israel chooses the nations. Israel chooses idolatry. Israel chooses the alternative. And so they go into captivity, and God allows them to come back. And has God given up? Absolutely not. And in fact, the stakes even seem to get a little bit higher, because then God will send Jesus of Nazareth, God with us. Emmanuel, we sang that this morning. And so God tabernacled with man in Christ. And you've read the gospel story. What does man choose? They chose to reject him and to nail him on a cross. 
and where God wanted to dwell with man, man even then chose the alternative. So what does God do? He raises his son on the third day and says, you know what? I'm done with you jokers. Well, no. You read the New Testament, you read Romans chapter 8, read 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6. God is trying to tabernacle with man today, I believe, through his own spirit. Because you know what God has always wanted? You. Like, why does God offer you heaven? Because God wants you. And I don't know how you view yourself. But this blows my mind. Because I would think me? I really am a nobody. I don't have any intrinsic value within myself. Why would God want me? What God wants isn't just me. He doesn't just want people. But he wants people that with their free will would choose him. And when at least I think about what heaven is going to be filled with, the people that heaven are going to be filled with, it's, we're not talking about the people who knew the most Bible. Be a lot of people who knew a lot of Bible who will be in hell. It's not what this is about. It won't be the people that went to church every Sunday. That helps, by the way. That's not what we're talking about. There'll be people who went to church who won't be with the Lord. We're talking about people who, that with their free will, chose God. And when you think about what, like, what God gains, God doesn't just gain you. God gets, gets you choosing him. And you know that to be true in any relationship. Those of you who are married, did you want your spouse to marry you out of some sense of compulsion? They didn't really want to be with you, but they felt like, ah, there's nobody else, and I might as well, and it's either you or nothing. Is that what you, have, that what you want? What does that relationship look like? That's not what anybody wants. So it's not crazy for God to want this because what you want, even in your own relationships, what you want is to be wanted. What you want is to be chosen, to be loved, to be appreciated, to be seen. This is what God wants, but he wants it with you. And he wants you to choose to want this as well. And so again, when you think about well, how close I am to heaven, it has nothing to do with I've been in the church for 50 years. I've been in these, in these walls for 50 years. These walls won't save you. Choosing God will. That's the mentality. That's the spirit that we need to have. And you can think, all right, well, great for God. Why would I want to be there? So we have to ask ourselves, again, I think to really understand why we want heaven, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do I truly long for? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Paul will actually talk about this, like, look at your body right now. And look at your life right now. And if you're honest, I don't care what age you are. I don't care where you're at in life. If you're honest with yourself, you know that things aren't the way that they should be. It's actually bizarre that as humans, we desire things we've actually never experienced. We want things and we want the world to be in a certain way that we've actually never seen. Everybody wants peace. Has like perfect peace ever existed in your lifetime? So you want something you've never seen. Everybody wants to be happy. You've ever like been perfectly happy? Absolutely not. Everybody wants things they've never seen. And I think the point is, is that you were created with certain longings. You were created with certain desires that are good desires. But that won't be filled here on earth. And so look at how Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, this physical body is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house, in this body, we groan. Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. I want to present to you maybe just a few longings that I think people have. That I think everybody has. And you may have different ones of these to varying degrees. But I think every one of us have these different longings. I think everybody longs to have a sense of real purpose. What am I doing? And why am I here? I think everybody in different ways tries to figure that question out. In fact, again, the book of Ecclesiastes, the whole book is Solomon is trying to figure that out. What is my purpose? Is there any real lasting value? What profit does man get for everything he does? Chapter 1, verse 3. 
Everybody's trying to figure out what the point is. What's their point? Let me tell you, figuring out what you want to do in school, that's not your real purpose. That's something you can do, but that's not your real purpose. That's not why you were created. But everybody's trying to figure out what their purpose is. I believe that everybody is longing for some real satisfaction. And you know that you have like bits and pieces of satisfaction here. You know that, but it's never permanent. Raise your hand if you ate today. All right. Keep your hand raised. Hang on. Keep your hand raised. Keep your hand raised if you're planning on not eating again for the rest of your life. Now y'all being greedy. You ate already. You grit. You ate, but this well, you weren't fully satisfied, and that's part of the human condition. In chapter one, you'll talk about the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear with hearing. Think about all the things you've seen in your lifetime. Would you say, all right, I've seen enough. I'm going to just shut my eyes and never see again. I've heard enough. I'm going to shut my ears and never hear again. That's, not, that, that's none of us because you're not truly satisfied here. Everybody longs to have real satisfaction. Everybody longs to have real value. What are you worth? Your bank account is not that, by the way. That's not what you're worth. How beautiful people say you are or aren't is not what you're worth. How intelligent you are is not what you're worth. You know why I believe the suicide rate is as high as it is today? Because people have no idea what they're actually worth. And they struggle with that. And they think nothing matters. And I don't have any value. So what does it matter? I don't think it's coincidence that you have so many people, celebrities, people who get to, they, they, they amass a certain following or they amass a certain fortune. And then they take their life. Because they realize all this stuff I have doesn't actually mean anything. And they feel empty. Because your value doesn't come from stuff here. It's a real longing that you have, but it won't be filled here. I think everybody longs to belong. And Jacob talked about this in the college class a little bit this morning. But everybody wants to be a part of something. That's why there's like 50, I don't have social media, but I remember when I had Facebook, there were like 50,000 different Facebook groups that you could be a part of, you know? There was Facebook groups for everything. Why is that? Because everybody wants to be a part of something. That's why people group together. That's why people want, like everybody wants to belong to something. And you're always afraid that you're going to be on the outside. You're always afraid that they're going to kick you out. You're always afraid that if you don't adapt and change, that somehow I'm not going to belong to this group anymore. Everybody longs to belong. And I think, down, I think that deep down inside, everybody longs for real intimacy. That you could be yourself and actually be yourself. That you don't have to hide bits and pieces of who you are. I think this is a real longing that everybody, by the way, has. And I think if we're honest, we struggle with real intimacy. We struggle with intimacy and I don't mean like sexual, I mean like real, actual, honest intimacy, really exposing who you are to people. That's a real struggle that humans have. Because again, you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of being let down. You're afraid of people saying, ah, you're struggling with that. That's who you are. In fact, think in your marriages. Does your spouse know everything about you? This is the place that you should be the most open. And even in that, this is a struggle for people. But these are longings that we have. Go to Revelation chapter 22. It'll be the last text we'll look at this evening. How does this throne above, how does going to heaven answer any of these longings for me? Why would I want to go there? Revelation 22, starting in verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from, here's our word again, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their forehead. There will no longer be any night, and they will, have, they will not have the need of the light of the lamp nor of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. 
So how does the throne in heaven answer these longings? Everybody wants to have real purpose. In heaven, your purpose will be realized. You get the idea of realize, like it'll come to actual true fruition. That you were created to serve God. We talked a little bit about that this morning, but that's why you were made. And we do that here, and we try as best as possible to do that here, but if we're honest, we do that imperfectly. And if you're really trying to choose God, I long for the day where I get to do it and not have to worry about, am I messing up? Am I doing it wrong? Am I... In heaven, you'll figure out what your real purpose has been all along. Heaven will be a place where you will have real satisfaction. Did you notice, by the way, in the text, one of the things is you won't even need the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun. Have you ever thought about how important the sun is like for everything here? For food, for gravity, for everything that you depend on. If the sun somehow disappeared, like we'd be toast. We'd be frozen, really, but you get the picture. We'd be in trouble. Heaven is a place where the thing that you think you need the most here, you won't even need it there. And all the things that we think we long for, all the things we think will give us satisfaction, heaven will be a place where those things will have no value because God will be there. That heaven is a place where your actual value will be realized because he said you'll reign with him forever and ever because you were actually made to serve God, but you were also made to reign with God. You thought about all the New Testament passages that talk about he raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly places where Christ Jesus is? You have far more value than the world tells you. You have far more value than you even think. God thinks far more of you than you might even think of yourself. But heaven will be a place where your value is realized. That heaven will be a place where you will belong and you will never, ever have to worry again about what, like, will they want me gone? Am I going to get kicked out of here? Because his name will be on their forehead. So you'll be a part of the most important group that anybody has ever wanted to be a part of. And anyone will want to be a part of. Because you'll be a part of God's people for forever. And never have to worry about, have I aged out of this group? Am I not cool enough to be here anymore? Do I? That won't happen. There'll be no concerns for that. Because you'll belong to God. And that sense of intimacy that you have, that you long for, the text says that they will see his face. Which blows my mind that God who knows me, and I don't mean like who knows things about me, God who knows me, will let me see him too. That's what heaven is going to be like. A place where God is for forever. And if there are streets of gold or not, who cares? If there's mansions, who cares? It doesn't matter. Because God will be there. In a second, we're going to sing this song. The Sands of Time. In the third verse, I think, in, in the book that y'all have, talks about even if I had to die seven times to be with God, it'd be a well-spent journey. Because if heaven is a place where God is, then heaven needs to be a place where you want to be as well. Suffer what you have to suffer. Give up what you have to give up. It does not matter. We need to be passionate about heaven. You know, sometimes we serve God out of a fear of hell. You know, there's fear-based obedience. And that's a real thing. And I think that's a God-given thing. You should be afraid of hell. You should be afraid of punishment. You know what the problem is with fear-based obedience? Is you'll do the bare minimum. You'll do whatever it is you have to do to not be punished. And there'll always be a cap to your willingness to serve. I think there's a second layer, maybe a deeper layer. That's rewards-based obedience. So it's not so much I'm afraid of being punished, but there's something I want. And that's why I'm serving God. And that's better, really. But even that will have its limitations. Because you'll serve as long as you think the prize is good enough. And you jump to love-based obedience. Well, you're not serving out of fear, though you should be afraid. 
And you're not serving just out of some reward, though you should want the reward. But you're serving because you love the Lord your God. And you don't want to displease Him, but rather you want to be with Him. And you want to make Him happy. And you want to reign with Him forever and ever. If you're not a Christian, you're living your life seeking after empty things. I don't have to convince you of that. You know that. Things that aren't satisfying you. Because they can't. And what the scriptures tell us is that eventually God will bring every deed into judgment. But if you live in Jesus Christ, if you've been forgiven of your sins through the waters of baptism, and you've lived your life choosing God, that there's this place that exists where God wants you to be. But you have to choose Him. If you're a Christian and you've been struggling with some sin, whether it's some secret sin or some sin that just a few people know and you need help from the, this congregation here, please make a change. Because it will not matter in your life if you gain all these things and miss out on the only thing that has ever mattered.